This is Art 490, Baroque Art History, and this is, uh, we're finishing up here with the uh, uh, architecture of the Baroque. Uh, to review back from the first part of the term, uh, this is a, a sequence of church facades beginning in the early 1400s, uh, Alberti's churches here, these two churches, and then uh, Palladio's in the mid-1500s, and uh, the other ones, the, the uh, up into uh, from the mid-1500s to uh, the 1600s in the Baroque, uh, the ones we saw before. Uh, notice that the first, the first two are essentially flat. You know, they're, 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 both of them are attempts to bring back, like the first, the first three, are attempts to bring back uh, uh, some qualities of, of antique art, uh, Greco-Roman architecture, and uh, this one looks very successful. It looks like uh, pediment and pilasters and and uh, uh, you know Alberti was was very adept and, and attuned to uh, uh, Greco-Roman architecture. And then that's the 1400s. And in the 1500s, Palladio did a systematic survey of all uh, uh, antique architecture and came up with a a, a theory, uh, a book on four books of architecture, which is extremely influential. We'll see see how it was influenced uh, in the Baroque shortly. And this is his facade, his example. And notice that from here on out that the, the central portion uh, is no longer flat, but is projecting forward. In, in, in this case, uh, there's two levels. This front level is like a, a pediment with uh, a Greek front facade, and then another one behind it uh, with, with flat pilasters, so that you have a, a, a major element and a minor element. The major element is, is projecting forward. Again, later church here with the uh, um, uh, middle part projecting forward, another one middle part. In fact, this one uh, has a section that's a little bit projecting forward. Uh, and this one, of course, is uh, Borromini's church, the Four Fountains, uh, with a wave in it. And, and it's uh, because it was a small church, you could get away with this extreme version of, of Baroque uh, theatricality and, and, and movement within architecture. But a more typically Baroque church uh, uh, has also this feature of a central part uh, projecting outward and the, the wings on either side projecting outward. So you have a, a major projection and a minor projection. You can see that even uh, more distinctly in, in the early part of the Baroque with the uh, St. Peter's Church. Uh, Moderno. Uh, design this with uh, this in mind. You can see influence of Palladio here with the uh, projecting columns with a pediment in the middle. Uh, but because it's much wider than the Palladio's church, uh, it has this opportunity to have two projecting wings on either side. The reason I'm pointing this out is because uh, later in the Baroque this will become a, a, a major feature uh, for, for palace designs. Here, for example, uh, is one you have on your list. Is this is uh, the Louvre? It's called the, the the East Wing of the of the Louvre, and uh, it was designed by Claude Perrault. Perrault, and uh, uh, it has the same feature. It looks similar to uh, Saint Peter's central part, uh, projecting out like this with a pediment and and uh, and columns. In this case, they're they're doubled columns instead of single columns. And these are actually projecting completely uh, away. You can see the shadow cast. It's, it's, it's projecting even farther forward here. Uh, these are engaged, or these, these are touching the building. So there's no space. They're not projecting as far forward. If you go back to Palladio here, these also aren't projecting all the way. So what uh, later in the Baroque, it becomes even more sculptural. That is, a, a, a greater projecting forward. And then the two wings on either side flanking. Uh, notice it's all they're all symmetrical, they're perfectly uh, aligned down the center. Um, that's that's a, a classical feature. And this building looks very very classical. In fact, when you think of Baroque, um, normally you think you know of this kind of thing. You know, it's it's, it's over the top, um, um, sculptural, and three dimensional and uh, let's see, having movement, and there's something that's projecting forward. I mean, just jump, leaping out forward towards you, uh, this kind of thing. 
Uh, but this wouldn't be appropriate for something like this. This has to be uh, has to communicate the power of the of the state. In this case, uh, this is the palace of the of the of the king. So the king of France of the king of France in Paris. Uh, this is his house. So uh, it's a huge complex of buildings, and you know it was created um, uh, over many many centuries. If you remember, way back when we did the. Uh, 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 the very rich hours of the Duke de Berry. Uh, there was a, a, a picture of one of those palaces, the one that has the uh, uh, the uh, cultivation in the front and the palace in the background. And that palace is the Louvre, is the original Louvre building. And uh, and its foundations are here too. Behind this is uh, it's a very large, complex uh, building. Here's the. This is all of it. Um, there's several different facades several different uh, complexes of buildings. But the one that we're looking at is just this one, the one that was built in the later Baroque in the 1660s. Twillery Gardens over on this side. This is the east side. Um, another feature that it has is that it seems to be built on a pedestal. What is the ground floor here uh, looks like it is just a, a, a big box upon which the, the, the building is. You know, it becomes this becomes a section, uh, a, a, a something to hold this up, as if this were just a uh, a pediment. But this is just another floor. This is just the uh, the ground floor. And it, and giving the fact that it's that it, it's it's a big wall here. It looks almost like a like a fortification. So that uh, you know, this is the as if this were the main part, and that this is holding this up. Uh, this this kind of articulation of a surface where you have a base here and then you have a middle part and then a, a, a cornice on at the top um, goes back to uh, Renaissance uh, palace architecture from 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 Florence I mean there was there's examples of buildings that, that have this same sort of articulation of facade but this is of course uh, much larger and grander uh, you know just it's in fact it's gigantic in comparison to the original model but this kind of model of having a, a, a basement, this is what this is called. The word basement means the part, the base, as if it were the base of a of a column, like the plinth, you know, as if as if this part of a column were turned into a floor of the building. If this, if you think of the the column as a model of the building, then this part is that basement, and then this is the projecting cornice, and then this part is is this middle floor, which, as you see, is actually two floors high. Um, it also has this colonnade made up of double columns. Uh, if we look back here, the idea of double columns also comes from the from St. Peter's, but in this case from Michelangelo's domes, having paired columns like this with a void between them. Uh, so if you think of this as the model of later Baroque buildings, uh, the projecting forward center part with flanking wings uh, comes from this facade, but the paired columns with a void between, and the idea of, of, of deep shadows, like uh, 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 the way Michelangelo's architecture was. If you look, uh, many of his features are such that deep carving so, so as to have uh, a strong light and dark contrast. Th this has, this is having having this recessed part back here so that the columns be, be, creates a plane out in the front, uh, but you also have deep shadows back here so as to uh, create some more drama uh, out of the thing. So big projecting front, dramatic thing here, the basement, all of these, these elements together become the, uh, the main design of just about all, all the palaces uh, and, and, and many, many big institutional, powerful buildings uh, from, from now on. I mean, uh, let's, you know, here's one. This is, this is Buckingham Palace in London, uh, made, you know, not, not, not much longer after, after, the, uh, after the Louvre. Uh, but this is the, the uh, royal residence uh, for in, in England, in London. So uh, it has the same features, the, the projecting center. Uh, this is a major projection, and then two miners on either end, 
uh, colonnade, in this case it's pilasters, and it has a, a, a deeply set thing behind columns here. So it's not exactly the same, oh, it's also the pediment uh, aspect. Uh, but it's not exactly the same, but it, you can see that it's, it has a very strong family resemblance. Uh, 200 years later, I mean, this is... Uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, Treasury Building in Washington. Uh, it's the building that's on the on the back of the ten dollar bill. Uh, it also has the same sort of features: the the, the central part, the flanking parts, uh, the basement part. I mean, this is this is just ubiquitous when you see start seeing government buildings, bank buildings, uh, big palaces, uh, a lot of the manor houses in in uh, in England. Um, you know, have this same sort of arrangement. This just this just becomes the the standard for for many buildings because you can see it, it has that 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 power to it and strength to it and a reference to um, to the Renaissance and all the way back to classical antiquity. There's so much. It looks so classical, and uh, uh, but it isn't exactly like classical architecture. And those features that I'm I'm pointing out are those that are uniquely Baroque things, uh, adapting this, this pediment aspect, the, the three-partite central uh, uh, projection and the flanking, and also this, this uh, shadowy background behind a colonnade is a, is, are all Baroque aspects. Uh, then we have the architect uh, named Mansart, who is uh, um, Who's going to, he, do, he does Versailles, uh, but just to show you another example of, of his work, uh, just so that you can see this the example of this kind of roof called a mansard roof. Uh, you may have seen it in haunted houses like uh, the Adam family houses like this. Uh, this is called a mansard roof because after after this architect we're talking about, and just as a point of interest, this particular building is uh, you know has the same features, uh, just in a in a slightly different style, but the projecting middle. And, and flanking on the sides, uh, columns and things. Uh, it's just a, another flavor of the same kind of thing. But now let's look at uh, Mansart's uh, work at uh, uh, Versailles, which is a uh, the country estate for the French royalty, out just just a little bit to the west of, of central Paris. Um, this was originally built as a uh, like a hunting lodge or something uh, out in the country. Uh, but it, it got it you know, rebuilt and modified over the course of centuries, and in the uh, in in the late Baroque, it, it became this, and this is uh, another version of the same sort of thing. Uh, you see that in this part here, the part that faces the gardens. Here, let's take a little look. Uh, this is this is the the palace grounds. This is the palace, and this here is the facade that we're looking at. Uh, but it faces this giant uh, vista of gardens, uh, and those are, you know, those are themselves a, 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 a monumental thing and, a, and, a, and an influential thing to gardens everywhere. Uh, but we're, that's not part of what we're dealing with. But it's just to understand that that's, this is all part of it as well. And but we're looking at the architecture of just this building here. There you can see a little more clearly. Um, how it has the same kind of features, uh, but in this case, it has even more windows, more lights coming in. You can see the giant, and we're going to see the, the interior on this one. But it's, it's very neoclassical and projecting of power and clarity and, um, uh, I guess, neoclassicism. Uh, is the central part projecting, projecting wings, basement thing and another thing about about basements or or ground levels is that the a lot of times the stone is articulated differently than at the top it, the stone is made to look um, um, rusticated or in this case it just looks it looks heavier and uh, gives the impression of strength you know so that you know how deep the wall is cut right here so as to make it look like this part is holding up this part which it technically is but it's uh, it, it's 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 a way to articulate the stone in such a way that it looks uh, strong and bold and robust, and then it gets more elegant as you go go up, which you know is a kind of uh, 
architectural feature that it goes all the way back to the Colosseum. But uh, um, that the original uh, Renaissance palaces that also had that feature did that as well. They would make this, the masonry at the bottom look look rough and, and strong so as to hold up the things above it. The inside, though, looks like this. This is uh, the Hall of Mirrors, just, just uh, on the inside of that facade. And it is what you kind of think of as Baroque uh, in another sense. When you think of uh, Baroque painting, not the, not the current that, that, that Caravaggio has. There's nothing, this has nothing in, in common with that. Uh, that's more austere and dark and, and you know, emotionally brooding, I can, you can imagine. But the other current, the one that begins with Karachi and the Farnese Gallery and the, um, uh, the subsequent followers for, for, for that kind of, you know, the, the, the ceiling paintings that we saw with, where you have huge numbers of figures uh, creating a chaos of, of, of motion and, and turbulence and, uh, and just a kind of decorative style where there's no place to rest your eyes, where there's just something going on everywhere. This is, it's called the, the Hall of Mirrors. It's, I think it's, it's a couple of hundred feet long. I mean, it's a huge, huge building all the way uh, across this, this facade as one complete room. And it has, you know, a, a barrel, barrel vault uh, ceiling that is, that is painted and Baroque kind of paintings, uh, sort of like the Farnese Gallery, where it looks like there's paintings that are stuck on the ceiling. Uh, and it has this decoration. And I just wanted to give you one example, you know, in the Baroque of what decoration looks like. Uh, and it's, it's, it's over the top. Uh, every surface is different. M marble on top of marble. Uh, uh, gilding. Lots of doodads. Uh, the mirrors themselves are, are a fantastically expensive thing uh, to make at the time. So having a huge wall of them is, uh, uh, is, is just another example of, of extravagance. Um, and crystal chandeliers everywhere. Uh, decoration just dripping everywhere. It looks like money. It looks like money and power. And so when you compare... You know, this is an expression of money and power, you know, in that it looks neoclassical. And this, this interior is where they lavish with decoration. So you just are overwhelmed with, with uh, the spending of money on stuff. And with the little Trump loyal things going on here, big gilt frames with paintings going everywhere. Uh, this is what it looks like today with uh, tourists in it, uh, but you can see the the how big it is. It just goes goes on forever, and there's just light pouring in here. There's there's you know a million of these little things going on. The, you know, it isn't enough that that it has a cornice, uh, and it'd be like a classical cornice, but it has to project out every now and then like this, so as to have more surface area for stuff and bumps and, and I don't know, corbels, uh, vegetal motifs. Look up here, the, uh, uh, the puti and the uh, other, other kinds of decoration are just spilling out all over the place just to have more opportunities to put gold and uh, glass and crystal and marble of, of all different uh, colors and textures. Okay, so that's, so that's that's French, and that's that's Versailles. Uh, let's look now at in, in England, uh, beginning at the early part of the century. We didn't look at uh, you know how they dealt with the uh, with the Baroque there. And this first example is by uh, Inigo Jones. Inigo Jones was a uh, an architect who had who was English, and he went to uh, Rome and you know, Italy, traveled Italy, and he studied the architecture there, uh, the, both, both the, the Renaissance architecture and ancient architecture, and especially Palladio's, his architecture. Uh, he went to all the villas and, and studied those. He also got the 
uh, original drawings of uh, of of Palladio that he used to make the book the book with, and and brought them back to England. And they're now in the Royal Institute of British Architects, or the ones the ones that I studied for my dissertation. Uh, but there's you you can you can see how the the drawings are made, uh, and and how a, a, someone goes about designing things using that uh, Palladio's philosophy of of uh, of design. Anyway, this is this is a, a called the banqueting hall, and it was part of a, a, a greater palace uh, called Whitehall. Uh, that was the uh, that the it goes back to, to Henry the Eighth and. Uh, he had built a Tudor, uh, uh, you know, King's Palace in London, and and it it was added on too many times. And this was at in the early Baroque, the eight, the sixteen, say the the thirties. Um, uh, he built this. No, earlier than that, probably in the teens. Uh, he built the uh, uh, the banqueting hall, and is is of a completely different style. the The rest of the building has was destroyed in a fire. And this was saved, uh, so this this is the only remaining part of it. So it's, uh, and it happens to be the part that is, the what, what we're looking at is the Baroque part. And and when I say this Baroque, I mean it is done in that period. Otherwise, this looks like something that could have been made in the Renaissance. Uh, in fact, it, it 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 looks almost as if it were made by Palladio, or just came just lifted right off of one of Palladio's drawings. This kind of alternating pediments of you know, uh, an arch with a triangle pediment, alternating like that. That that goes back to Palladio. Um, the uh, the swags here. Uh, look at say. We go back to. Here they are. You know, the, 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 you you can find precedents for, for all of these things, in the Renaissance, or in Palladio's drawings. You know that it's it's as if it it were uh, something that was taken out of time. And put in here in the Baroque period, and you know, considering the other things that we've seen that were Baroque, they're obviously Baroque-looking, and you know, they have some quality, like you know, their their extravagant uh, decoration, or or that their sculpture in some way that that's projecting in some uh, extreme way, or that is projecting a huge amount of power. It doesn't have any of those qualities of 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 bar the Baroque. This is just happened to be done. In the Baroque period, but of a style that was um, very common in the in the Renaissance. So it's comparable to what, say, Karachi was doing, say, in painting, where uh, you know, whereas the prevailing painting style was 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 the Caravaggio style, but uh, he was bringing back uh, Karachi was bringing back Renaissance kind of characteristics. So the Baroque has those both of those the sort of neoclassical aspect and the the other aspects of Baroque we think of as the, the painting kind of things the emotion theatrical and all of that look at the, the inside uh, of the of, of the banqueting house at Whitehall uh, and it also has that same sort of very clear austere uh, neoclassicism that you you would expect for something made in the Renaissance, or you know, not necessarily made in the Renaissance, but designed in the Renaissance. That is, you know, the the designs of Palladio's buildings. Uh, you know, he had lots and lots of drawings that dis, that were that are just designs. Uh, some of them were made, and some of them weren't. But uh, uh, I told you at the time that, you know, that Palladio's work was was one of the most influential uh, architectural books ever made. And this is an example of it, where it was just resurrected whole in a period where everything else was very different from it. But it was uh, this in itself is going to be hugely influential because many many buildings uh, are are based on this kind of style rather than the other one. So, um, uh, say the White House uh, would be an example, or or uh, 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 Monticello by Thomas Thomas Jefferson was was hugely influenced by. Inigo Jones and going back to Palladio when he made the uh, Monticello and say the um, University of Virginia campus, which he also also des designed this sort of austere, clean lines with um, and emphasis on the design and the proportion of everything. Uh, but 
if you look up, you see this kind of thing. As you can see it here a little bit. This 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 kind of decoration here, and this kind of painting, uh, shows that of the the period that it was made in. I mean, this is this is definitely a Baroque painting. In fact, it's it's a Rubens, uh, the ceiling painting, the kind of thing that we saw with uh, uh, let's see, Pulzo or Gaudi, the the uh, the, the, the ceiling, the church ceiling frescoes uh, that we saw. This is a Rubens doing that sort of thing where you have figures seen from below uh, floating in the skies called the apotheosis of, of, uh, of the English monarch here, uh, James, uh, um, and just floating in the sky. So, so very, very Baroque and everything. And even the, the decoration of all this stuff is, is Baroque. In fact, that it's, that it's so excessive and that is just in stark contrast to the the clean lines and the simpleness of everything else. Like, look at this space right there. There's just nothing happening there. Uh, you know, all of them are just it's just a it's just a rectangle that you look at as a having a proportion, a relation, a, a geometrical relationship to the other parts, and they and they, everything all relates geometrically. And when you think of how different that is to to this. You know, these these this is just a, a different way of looking at the world. Uh, with this, both of which are in the Baroque, and also both of which are hugely influential to, to buildings that come afterwards. Then we have uh, another English architect who's, who is uh, Christopher Wren, or Sir Christopher Wren. He was uh, at the other end of the of the Baroque, the the sixteen. Um, 60s. Uh, it happened in 1666. There was a fire in London, which destroyed much of the city of London. And afterwards, there was a, a rebuilding campaign. And uh, Christopher Wren was in charge of it. One of the things that was burned was the old cathedral of London, it was St. Paul's Cathedral, which was a, a medieval uh, cathedral from the, the, the 1300s. Uh, and that was gone. So they uh, replaced it with the uh, a Baroque building, from uh, by an, by someone who wasn't even an architect. Christopher Wren was uh, he was like a uh, a classical scholar from Oxford, who studied uh, astronomy and optics, and he started the Royal Society, and he was a scientist and did all sorts of you know scientific papers and things, uh, and and they 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 charged him with designing uh, all the churches that we were burned down and many of the buildings that were burned down in London. Uh, I think it's maybe fifty. 52 or so churches uh, that are, he's responsible for. But he, he had gone to, to, to Paris, uh, saw the, the works that were doing there, the, the Louvre, the uh, uh, Versailles. He met Bernini there. He was, uh, he was you know, in the midst of all this uh, uh, new design styles that, that, it, that had been brewing in the, in the Baroque, as well as the, the, the style of Inigo Jones in the and going back to Palladio, so, and let's say let's add Michelangelo to the mix. So uh, he 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 took all of these influences and put them together to create uh, Saint Paul's, this new Saint Paul's. If you look at things like the articulation of this wall, you know this looks a lot like. Um, let's go back, you know, to this kind of thing. You know, it looks like a a, a simple. Um, Palladio, the adjective for Palladio is Palladian. Uh, Palladian architecture is just a, an articulation using, uh, using classical elements. And then on top of that, he puts a dome, very similar to Michelangelo's dome. If you look back, uh, I can't see it here. Didn't I have a picture? Yeah, I did. Here's one. This kind of, you know, the, you have this dome, uh, semicircular dome, except the top is 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 a little pointy. It's not exactly a, a hemisphere. It's a little taller uh, than a hemisphere, and then it's artic articulated with a with a lantern. And see the uh, uh, the double columns here with the shadowy between on the in, on the outside. So he took this. There he is, and and he added uh, an even deeper uh, colonnade. Uh, so you have a greater light and dark shadow. Uh, on the inside here, and they also let's look at the just the inside. He engineered his own dome, uh, different from all the others. This one has 
the you know it is a double shell going back originally to Brunelleschi's dome in, in Florence, but in the inner shell it is a cone here uh, that holds up the lantern. So the weight of the lantern uh, goes down onto this cone, and then there's an inner shell here, uh, and then there's this outer part here. So he's got a much more complex mathematically engineered dome for to make it huge. I mean, look how look how large it is in relationship to the building. It's it's covering up the entire crossing. In addition, not just the um, the nave part, but the aisles as well. Like this this is where the nave is, or the well, it's the nave's on the other side, but the, the central part, and then the the aisles on either side going on the inside of the building. This is covering both of them, or all three of them. Uh, from all directions, so it's this is, is a, a huge thing, and it's it's a big, uh, you know, it, it was the tallest building up until the you know the 1960s for in London, uh, and it was, you know, a, a prominent feature if you ever look at, you know, footage of World War II and the bombing of London. It was, uh, it was a, it was, it was hit several times, but it wasn't destroyed. Let's look at the. The facade, and think of the facade in relationship to the buildings that we've seen: uh, uh, Central Park projecting, the wings on either side, the combination of, of uh, 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 Palladian architecture, uh, Michelangelo ar architecture, the uh, uh, Perrault's uh, Louvre with the with the double columns. And the uh, shadow in the background, so you have this deep set behind a curtain of or uh, curtain wall of, of these 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 paired columns, and then you have uh, going up with these two towers, something that the other buildings didn't they didn't they weren't churches, so they didn't have these big church towers. But if you look at these these this looks like it comes from um, the top of of uh, of the Florence Cathedral dome. This kind of in and out you know pediment design here with the extra extra bit of, of ornamentation that's not a, uh, not entirely classical uh, kind of uh, baroque actually uh, going up here you usually you can put extra ornament up there uh, you know so he, he's put together many different things to create this this one design and this this uh, this this is the church that's in uh, Mary Poppins by the way uh, the, the woman who sells the uh, bird seed for, for tuppence a bag it sits down here and these are the saints and apostles that look down as she sells her wares uh, and this this dome itself is is, is itself an influential thing um, if you look at uh, the dome of the of the US Capitol uh, it is also you know it's, 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 it looks like it's a it's almost a copy you look at say, that angle, that's St. Paul's, and this is the Washington Dome. Um, and originally, this building was just, you know, this part. If you look at that in relationship to what we've been looking at, this looks like it's a Palladian building seen through the eyes of the Baroque, with with a, a, a screen of of uh, doubled columns here, with a big shadowy deep part in the middle there, and this is projecting forward and and. Uh, they didn't have the wings on the outside until later when they added these these parts, you know. So it now uh, and it's projecting even farther than than any of the other examples that we saw. But you, you can see that all of these things have a family resemblance, and they all go back to uh, to, to neoclassical times. And there's a a, a a sequence of steps from neoclassical to the Renaissance to the Baroque, uh, where you can you know can find you can find where all of these features. Are uh, are manifest in their different different periods. Uh, here's the interior of St. Paul's, uh, and you can see it is articulated. Uh, you know, these big massive walls with barrel vaulted uh, uh, ceilings here on the on the nave, the transept naves, and and this is the crossing dome. Uh, but this look, you know, is essentially goes back to the Roman baths. Uh, had this look, these coffers. Are made to design to look like the Roman, the ceilings how they were articulated in the Roman times. Uh, but 
a, a, a more recent uh, example of, of, of the, where, where this is copied from is uh, St. Peter's also has this. You know, so uh, though this isn't quite on the scale of St. Peter's, it's the same sort of design. And uh, so there you have uh, the Baroque, that, that, that concludes the Baroque architecture, and that also concludes the, uh, uh, the works on your list.